Hello everyone, my Power of Three video depicts the elderly's wish to age in place because as we all know, home is where the heart is. Aging in place is much more than living in an environment of choice as one gets older. It means home, a place where emotional and functional needs are met. Home is a foundation where family histories are created and rich memories have been woven from shared experiences. The essence of home is to feel safe in an environment where you have the ability to control and enjoy your experiences. However, aging can lead to reduced physical abilities and make navigating around one's home more difficult. From basic home modifications to assistive technology, one's home may actually serve to maintain independence by compensating for reduced functionality. A few weeks ago, we learned about Senior Smart, a research-driven partnership dedicated to delivering innovative technology to keep older adults in their home and maintain their independence longer. The Senior Smart Initiative includes three objectives. Smart Home, which enables older adults to stay in their home through the use of new technologies and community services. Smart Wheels, which helps seniors maintain the ability to drive safely and rehabilitates those who have temporarily lost that ability due to health issues. Smart Brain, which promotes brain health while preventing cognitive decline and brain diseases. Some of the assistive technologies designed by Senior Smart include carpet sensors to indicate when someone has fallen, wrist watches that track vital signs, and cars that respond to and monitor driver alertness. One of the potential problems for those who wish to age in place is that their homes may not be senior friendly. So why not make simple modifications and prolong the length of stay in your home? AARP has partnered with the National Association of Home Builders to create a designation for certified aging in place specialists trained in designing and modifying residences for the elderly. Home modifications can be changed up front or over time as the homeowner's functionality decreases. These modifications can include bath and shower grab bars, adjusted countertop heights, first floor master bedroom and bathroom access, wider doorways, and non-slip floors in the bathrooms. In your opinion, is aging in place a cost-effective approach to caring for the elderly population? Hello everyone, I am Jenna Rogers and this is my power of three on family caregiving. Family caregiving occurs when family members provide care for their loved ones in the place of professional caregivers. Most of those receiving the care suffer from a disability or have aged to the point that they can no longer care for themselves. Those that care for family members typically assist with activities of daily living including eating, dressing, toileting, and bathing. Family caregivers also assist with instrumental activities of daily living. These include housework, taking medications, managing money, buying groceries, and transportation within the community. Family caregivers also provide emotional and sometimes financial support. It is a privilege to have the means to take care of your loved ones. However, the stress that comes with that can be enormous. Caregiver burden has been defined as alterations in a caregiver's emotional and physical health which can occur when demands outweigh available resources. As you can imagine, many of those that are caregivers for their loved ones have to dedicate a large amount of their time to caring for a family member. Caregivers are also tasked with balancing their personal lives and careers in conjunction with being a caregiver. Family members are reported to spend 20 hours a week providing unpaid care to those that are 50 or older. Family caregivers typically experience physical, psychological, and financial stressors, including headaches, backaches, higher anxiety, fatigue, and symptoms of depression. 
Those that provide care for their aging parents while taking care of their children are members of the sandwich generation. Currently, about one in eight Americans between the ages of 40 and 60 are members of the sandwich generation. Those that fall in this category are charged with providing the typical 20 hours of care per week to their parents while simultaneously supporting and raising their children. My mother has been a member of the sandwich generation for the past 12 years. She cared for my grandfather until he passed away five years ago. She still acts as a caregiver to my grandmother who will be 92 in August. Throughout this whole time, she has supported me emotionally and financially and hasn't missed a beat. Personally, I see the toll that this takes on her, not only the stress that comes from providing that care, but also watching your parent age and lose their independence. Despite this burden, I know she loves being able to care for her parents and wouldn't trade it for the world. So my question to you is, should family members acting as caregivers receive training and or compensation? My name is Maurice Mitchell and this video is meant to provide an introduction to the role informal caregivers play in long-term care and the growing need for programs to support the savings they provide. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter once said, there are only four kinds of people in the world. Those who have been caregivers, those who are currently caregivers, those who will be caregivers, and those who will need caregivers. At some point, most of us will be directly affected by the issue of informal caregiving. While some people receive care from paid caregivers, most rely on unpaid assistance from families, friends, and neighbors. It is estimated that at least 75% of all care received by older adults in the United States is provided by family members and friends, and many who do not consider themselves caregivers. Roughly 44 million Americans provide 37 billion hours of unpaid informal care each year for adult family members and friends with chronic illnesses or conditions. Caregivers act as extensions of the healthcare system, offering unpaid assistance that is valued at roughly $350 billion. These family caregivers play an important role in the healthcare system but are often overlooked. As we continue to live longer, there will be an even greater need for informal caregivers Yet, there will be fewer potential caregivers available due to our country's changing family structure and increased mobility. Those caregivers who are available will need more support from policymakers in the form of options for public services, access to respite care, and even economic incentives. Informal caregivers make many sacrifices to provide assistance for loved ones. Many struggle to balance their work life with the added responsibility and sometimes lose employment. One survey reported caregivers spend $5,000 a year out of pocket to assist a family member. The added stress of providing care can also lead to physical and sometimes mental deterioration. In conclusion, there are generally three agreed upon mechanisms for supporting informal caregivers. Paying caregivers directly, tax credits, or requiring that employers grant time off without pay. Which do you believe would be more effective and can you think of any potential negative side effects of these policies? Can you think of any other solutions? My name is Brian Jenkins and today I want to talk to you a little bit about aging friendly communities. Many of the elderly would love to remain independent and live on their own, but they face many obstacles. Even if their homes are well equipped, many of their communities are not functional for the elderly. The idea of someone having a wheelchair or a walker is so that they can still get around despite having a disability. Having the ability to maintain your independence as you age is a relevant issue to us all. And a large part of that may be not having to be sent off to a nursing home or feel like you're trapped within your own home. Our current long-term care system does not seem to be well equipped to help our population age within our homes and communities, but we need to switch to a more community-focused approach to find a solution. An aging-friendly community is one in which older adults are valued by the community, involved in community life, and receive necessary supports to accommodate the needs. Some of the characteristics of an aging-friendly community are accessible and affordable transportation, housing, health care, safety, and community involvement opportunities. 
There will need to be things such as wider sidewalks and wider bike lanes and less busy crosswalks. Multi-generational housing meant to address the shortage of caregivers and or community hubs that can provide a range of services under one roof. The idea is that you can create a community that will foster growth from ages 8 to 80. If you're wondering why there is a need for aging friendly communities, think about the following. The U.S. population is growing older, including yourself. Approximately 10,000 people are turning 65 daily. In the year 2030, the 65 and older proportion will be about 1 in 5. As mentioned previously, our current long-term care system is not very well equipped to provide our elderly with the best quality of care now, let alone with all the massive growth we will be seeing in the future. A fundamental shift needs to occur, and where success has already been seen is in a more community approach to care. Now that you are well aware of what an aging friendly community is and the necessity of them, I would like to pose a question. If you think possible at all, how do you propose funding should be provided for aging friendly communities? Hello, my name is Stephen White and this is my Power of Three photo story for long term health, which as you can see, someone having a little bit too much fun has entitled Home Sweet Home. I'm going to discuss what I have learned about home health and institutionalized health, such as nursing homes or assisted living facilities. I will discuss some of the pros and cons of each healthcare setting. And at the end, I'll ask you a question that will hopefully challenge you to think outside of the box. So let's get started. So many of us maybe have had a loved one or know of someone who has needed long-term care. It's not an easy task to take care of someone who needs care. Although, I believe the general consensus is that people would rather be taken care of at home rather than feel they're in an institution and feel confined to the rules of the SNFs. The freedom of being taken care of at home is exactly what it means. You are home. You are able to do the things that you want to do without the restrictions that a long-term facility may have. Although, is this the best option for this individual? How does one choose the best healthcare setting which is best suited for them or their loved one? The first thing that comes to mind that everyone usually thinks about is, can my loved one be taken care of appropriately? Soon followed by, how much is this going to cost? Or what kind of commitment is this going to take to take care of this person? These are all very important questions that need to be asked before a decision is made. And these are hard decisions, but decisions that need to be made nonetheless. So you've decided that home health is the best option. And you'd be correct. The benefits of staying at home are as Little Caesars commercials put it, there's no rules until someone tells you to put your shirt back on and then you figured out there's at least one rule. With home health, you get to stay at home and stay engaged with the things you've always done. You can also get support from your community. It can be substantially less expensive than institutional care. As long as you have the right resources available, that being a family member, or a close friend that is reliable. It also depends on the needs of the person that's needing this care. How much care do they actually need? Do they need help with only minor things on a daily basis? Or do they need constant monitoring and assistance? In addition, Medicare doesn't typically pay for long-term home health, which means that most costs incurred are either paid out of pocket or through the assistance of long-term care insurance. And long-term care insurance is very expensive. And if one does not have a good structure at home with someone to help care for them, then this is where one might think of using the services of a nursing home or an assisted living facility. One of the things that nursing facilities are notorious for is the feeling of being in an institution. Some are trying to transition the environment to make it feel more like a home-based setting, such as having kids around, indoctrinating humor, bringing in pets, listening to some good tunes, having some good food, and of course making sure things smell nice, which all helps the healing process and adds to the quality of life of older individuals. Although, this is probably not where people were thinking they were going to be when they retired. Nursing homes are extremely expensive. 
Although, just because they might be expensive doesn't mean that they provide the best care or even better care than one might be able to receive at home. So it's important to do the due diligence and research the facilities. The good thing about good nursing facilities and the reason that anyone would want to go there to begin with is so that they can get the attention that they need and be taken care of in an appropriate manner. We met with Melissa Yetter at the Heritage and she stated that anything that happens at the home will happen at the facilities and she is spot on. It's important that regardless of where things happen, be it at home or a nursing facility, the patient be taken care of quickly. Now it is time for the deepest, most brain scattering question, which is going to get me an A on the rubric. Take a few seconds to reflect on what I just talked to you about. Think about what each healthcare setting brings to the table. Okay, here goes the question and your cognitive skills for the rest of the day. If you had the choice and the power to choose between home health and institutionalized care, which would you choose? Why? How would you fund either choice? And should one invest in long-term care insurance early in life? Good luck with the question. Thank you for your attention and I hope you have learned as much as I have from this class.